boss. Good job. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, Chisholm Trail Cowboy Church Band. My goodness. Give them a hand. Some good stuff. Maybe you want to run up here and preach instead of just walk, you know? Anyway, let's get going here. Okay, hey, just a couple of announcements here. I know you already got announcements, so I'll give you some more. If you notice, there's some sidewalks out there that uh, Mr. Al and Dalton built, put together for those of us who are a little, got a little extra hitch in our giddy-ups. You know, you can get right there, pull up right next to it, get out, be safe on the sidewalk. But don't forget that there's a whole drop-off area in the back for those who it's a little bit harder for, okay? Because uh, these sidewalks are a little bit of a slope, and sometimes it's a little bit harder. But don't forget that back there in the back, there's a drop-off area. It makes it a whole lot easier to drop folks off. Cool? All right. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time that you've allowed us to have this morning to gather together to, to worship you. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit's ignited in every single one of us, allow us to understand what it is you have to say to us today. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, that they don't walk out of here without him, that he become their Lord and Savior and that they be yours forever in your kingdom. Father, we do all this to glorify you. We want to ask that you be with those who couldn't be here today for whatever reason. I know there are a lot of folks out there that are sick. Uh, there's some folks out there that are traveling. I pray that they may find some time to spend with you today as well. So, Father, we just praise you again for this time, and we do it all to glorify you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I've been real fortunate here lately. I've uh, I come across a laptop, and I've written a bunch of sermons on it. And I'm like, oh, look in here. Look at these cool sermons that I wrote. A, I either didn't preach it to them, or B, they won't remember them. <laughs> you know? But anyway, I come across this one, and I was like, oh, man, look at this. This is pretty cool. And so I recycled it. It's called, what does it say on your sermon notes? Because it might be different from my title. <laughs> Staying hooked. Yeah, that's right. Staying hooked. Staying hooked. Let me show y'all something. Uh, Staying hooked. This is what I mean by that. Who wants to get hooked? Anybody? They're nice and rusty. Tetanus all over them. Look, they don't even spin. They don't even spin. Perfect. Perfect for the example. Cody, they don't even spin, man. They're like rusted shut. That's how you stay hooked. Normally they spin, but you can put this little, see this little hole right here? Well, some of you can't see it. You still can't see it. There's a little hole right there, trust me. And you put a pin through there, and it keeps it from spinning. You stay hooked that way. Any, any of y'all watch bull riding? Yeah. I don't watch bull riding as much anymore. I used to watch it. You know, I'm from a different... Like, all my guys are like the Chris Shivers and Justin McBride and the Adriana Marias and all that stuff. I don't know all these newer guys. There's like a J.D. Mooney and, uh, heck, he's old. <laughs> he's old, baby. Yeah, so like, I don't even know any of these new guys. But anyway, when I'm talking about staying hooked, usually when, uh, when you're on a mount, whether it be a horse or say you decided to get on a bull, this is how you stay hooked. You sink these into their side, and you don't let them out. Because <laughs> if you do, you will go flying. Anybody here ever rode a bull? Anybody? Not very many. I rode a bull once. Did I tell you all about that? I probably did, but I'm going to tell you again. I rode a bull once, attempted it twice. The first time, the first time, I'll tell you what happened. I got on the bull. I settled down in the chute, right? I tied myself on. Nice and good. And then you realize, okay, there's no more steps to take. The next step is just nod your head and let's go, right? When you get to that point, something starts to happen to you on the inside. Like it feels like it's not just... It's, it's like, like 
boom, boom, boom. Like you can see it through your shirt. You can see it through your shirt. And this is what happened. So I settled down in there. I put my hand on the rail. I looked at the boys like, all right, here we go. Well, this bull takes a deep breath. It's like he knows what's fixing to happen, right? And he just goes, It's like he just keeps on swelling and swelling and swelling, and the rope is getting tied around my hand and tied around my hand, and I'm like, let me off. <laughs> let me off. They're like, no, we're going to open the gate. I said, it'll be the last thing you do if I survive this. Do not open that gate. He's like, are you serious? I said, watch me. I'm not too proud. I undid that thing. I got, I got out of there. I said, no, I ain't riding a bull. <laughs> Look, I'll admit it. I was, I was chicken, chicken that, that day. day. I, I wasn't, wasn't the, the only, only one, but we won't mention anybody else. else. Fast, Fast forward, or I don't know. I can't. I, can't, I was, was a teenager, teenager then, and I was almost 30, or maybe, maybe I was 30 when I finally rode one. It was at the other cowboy church, church there in Salado. And, and I settled down, down in the shoes, y'all. This dude was, was a monster. This guy, this bull. Whew, he, he was spotted, spotted too. He's one of the longhorns, you know, know, real athletic. And he had horns on him about, about like that. that. Sort of off, don't get me wrong. And, and when, when I looked at this thing, thing right, he was huge. huge. I, mean, I mean, everybody else saw this little bitty, skinny, skinny bull, whatever. whatever. All right, but, but nobody, nobody else was riding him. I was. So, so what I saw was this big, giant, nasty, hooking monster. So I got down in the shoes, and I got tied on, and the rail's a whole lot higher up here because, all right, so the bull's not as big as the other one, all right, well, whatever, whatever, those are just details, okay, guys? So I'm holding on to the rail, and I feel much more confident, and this one never swelled up, like, never swelled up, as a matter of fact, there wasn't a whole lot to them, <laughs> okay, I almost wrapped my legs around them, so I was like, my right, boys let him out, and the gate comes open. And, and would you believe that this little bitty bull, he could get after it. A little surprising. He jumped out about four hops, maybe two, I don't know. I'm going to say four. I'm going to say four because it sounds better. All right. But he went, like, about the length of maybe to the first row here. And he took a hard left. I mean, a hard left. And, and he, he forgot, forgot me. me. Like, like, he left, left me there and, and continued on without me. <laughs> and so, that's my whole bull riding story. That's, that's, that's it. And uh, I didn't stay on because I was too lazy to go swap out my spurs. I said, nah, I'm just going to get on for a little. I couldn't hook onto that sucker for nothing. I'm falling off. <laughs> trying to stay on. I fall off anyway. Anyway, anyway, that, that wasn't part, part of my sermon, sermon notes, but you're, you're welcome. welcome. So, a long, long time ago, you know, from time to time, time we have these things here called cook-offs. And, and uh, we, we get, get pretty competitive, competitive about our cook-offs, do we not? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Where Mike Dirk is at? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Competitive. Now, now where's Wap Bill at? What do you mean I didn't win? Dog, they didn't choose you, man. I don't know what you... So, one time... We were having a chili cook-off, and I made some delicious chili, y'all, okay? And it really was. I'm not making that up. I won. Actually, I didn't win. I got second. Details. But this young lady, she come up to me, because she had been talking trash to me all week. She was a little girl. And she made a very interesting statement regarding my award-winning chili. She, she said, said, you better be glad I wasn't, wasn't here last week. In other no, words, alluding to the fact that had she been here, I wouldn't have received this awesome, great, prestigious award of second place. That her chili would have been better than mine, and therefore I would have been bumped off the podium because they were only given two places. So when true preacher... Pastor, fashion, full of humility and humbleness and grace. I, I said to this little 12, maybe 13-year-old girl, you ain't never beat me at nothing. 
I said, when did you ever beat me at anything? And she said, as calm as she could be, a little 12, 13-year-old girl having a grown man talking smack her, just jokingly, obviously. I said, you ain't never beat me at nothing. She looked at me and she goes, you're right, I haven't. But I'm not going to stop until I do. Whoa. Whoa. Immediately, I felt like I needed to defend myself, you know? But she said, I'm not going to stop until I do. So then I said, you know, the Holy Spirit hit me right then and there. And I said, tell you what, you stay hooked long enough, you will. In other words, if you stick with it and are determined enough, you can do whatever you want. Even something so far-fetched like beating me in a cook-off. That's, That's funny, funny y'all. Laugh. laugh. <laughs> That's, That's how it goes. goes. So, sticking with it, staying hooked, staying on, even though that bull bucks, and he bucks hard, got to stay hooked, don't we? So, how long should we ride with God? Let me ask you that question. If you're following along there on your sermon notes. How long should we ride with God? When is it acceptable to step off? It ain't. It ain't acceptable to step off. The ride with God should last a lifetime. Actually, way off into eternity, but in the context of this life, this ride should last forever, right? Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you another silly question, since we're talking about bull riding and stuff like that. Who do y'all consider the greatest bull rider of all time? Somebody say it louder. Lane Frost, right? If you don't know who Lane Frost is, get out. No, I'm just kidding. Lane Frost. What kind of pride, legacy, legendary status would Lane Frost have attained if he just stepped off every bullet seven seconds? And Lane Frost rode some of the toughest bulls of all time. As a matter of fact, let's play a little game. It's not in my sermon notes. I hope we have time. Oh, well, you're getting it anyway. If I say, I'm going to say the cowboy, you say the bull. If I say Lane Frost, Red Rock, that's right. Pretty good. If I say Tough Hederman, Bodacious, ain't somebody here like Rodeo. If I say Chris Shivers, Little yellow jacket. That's right. Like each cowboy is like he had his nemesis. And Red Rock at the time was the baddest dude, baddest bull on the ground when Lake Frost was going. Asked if he was here and we could ask him. We could ask Lane Frost how, many, how much money he won riding left Red Rock seven seconds. Or tough heat of me on or bodacious or so on and so forth. Ask these fellas how much money they won for riding seven seconds. They will all tell you zero. They all won zero. The ride needs to last eight seconds. You're immediately disqualified from the prize if you ride for any less. Heck and rodeo staying on for eight seconds doesn't even guarantee you a win. <laughs> but it puts you in contention. If, if you, you stay, stay hooked and stay on, sooner or later, you're going to win the prize. But you, you have, have to stay hooked. You have to stay attached. Let's read some, let's read some scripture. Y'all turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'll give you a chance to get there. Find it. We're going to start off in verse 5. Then we're going to read some more. John 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Y'all want me to cowboy that up a little bit? Y'all want me to cowboy that up here? I'll cowboy that up. Watch this. 
I am the bull. You are the cowboy. If you remain on me and I under you, you'll win a prize. But apart from me, <laughs> you will win nothing. Thank God he gives us unlimited amounts of re-rise, amen. Until the day we take our last breath, you have an opportunity for re-rise. Praise the Lord for that. So, but what does it mean to remain in Christ? What does it mean? Well, first, we have to start by believing that he is God's son. That's what gets you grafted into that vine, amen. That's what gets you grafted. That's what gets you hooked on in the first place. That's what gets you tied on, if you will, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's number two. By believing he's God's son, number two is by accepting him as your Lord and Savior. Number three, how do you stay on? By doing what he says. By doing what he says. Continuing to believe the gospel. And number five, relating in love to the community of believers. Relating in love. In love. And I know here at the Cowboy Church, sometimes we don't treat each other that way, but hey, we're all growing in Christ, okay? That's all part of the growing ministry, amen? We're not looking down on anybody for not acting right. We're all growing in Christ, amen? But that's part of growing up in your salvation. Believing, accepting, remaining, continuing, and then relating to others in love so that they may see you and your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. But let's read it all. Let's go back to verse 1. We're still, everybody's still on John chapter 15. Let's go to verse 1. Let's read some more. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off. Every branch in me that bears no fruit. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. When we stay hooked with God, he does these things for us. All the branches that are in us that are not creating fruit, he wants them gone. I want those branches gone out of my life, right? We all have plenty of branches in our lives that aren't producing very much fruit, amen? Amen. And, and when, when you, you, you wonder, wonder sometimes, sometimes how, how do I get past this? this? How, how do I beat this stuff? stuff? The world's beating me up left and right. How do I do this? Well, if we, we remain in Christ and he remains in us and his word remains in us, God will start pruning away at those branches that don't produce anything. He doesn't want them for you either. As a matter of fact, he'll go on a little further. Watch this. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He prunes so that that particular branch can become better at producing. So that it will bear that much more fruit and become that much more productive. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Hooked. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. There he is. He's telling us. You cannot bear fruit apart from me, Jesus is saying. And I'm not trying to compare Jesus to a rough bucking bull, because he's not that away. But following Jesus could be like riding a rough bucking bull, right? Because of the way the world is. Okay? That's why when you're sitting there in the chute and you get ready to nod your head, you better be sure. You better be sitting deep. You better be tied on good. And you better be hooked on. Because we have to remain in him. We have to remain on him to be productive. 
Of course, verse 5 says again, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And there he goes again, explaining a little bit more. If anyone does not remain in me, if anyone chooses to be detached from me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire. And burned. Check out number seven. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be given to you. That's pretty cool. See, our wants, when our wants align with God's wants, guess what we always get? When we, what we want. When we want what God, when we're so immersed in him that our wants become his wants, we always get what we want. It's when we keep one foot out. Keep one foot in the world. I probably look pretty goofy right now, but this is an illustration. I don't care. Right? You try to keep one foot out of the deal. Can't play like that. Some of you, some of you folks that raised your hand uh, earlier when I said y'all ride bulls, let me ask you this question. Those of you who have ridden bulls, what if I took one of your legs and tied it up like this and made it unuseful to you? That's a silly question, right? But, I mean, the outcome is pretty evident. You're going to get your world rocked. <laughs> but some of us try to walk along with God with one foot out, wondering why we're getting beat up so bad. Why is this so rough? Because when we get ready to nod our head, we need to be sitting deep, tied on good, and having spurs sunk in. Both of them. Not one of them. So in verse 8 says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. This is how you glorify God, Jesus says. That you become a branch that bears much fruit. That you become a branch that has been hooked onto the vine. It's been hooked for so long that God's been doing a work in it. How does God get rid of the branches that bear no fruit? How does he do that? Like when you're reading the Bible, I hear this all the time from people. To me, this is great testimony. But some people be reading the Bible and say, man, I, I read the Bible and... and, and Man, it just it hurts my feelings. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's the pruning. God's showing you the things that need to be gone, the things that need to stay, the, need, the things that you, you need to work on, and the things that you need to absolutely have nothing to do with. That's how he does it. That's not a surprise. But we have to have enough, enough discipline, enough want to in ourselves to stay hooked and stay disciplined. The world is doing the best it can to yank us away from everything God stands for. And I don't think it's going to be getting any better anytime soon. But we have to, as individuals, begin stepping up, doing better, understanding what it really means to follow Jesus Christ. Coming to church on Sunday, listening to me preach, is not following Jesus Christ. You must have a relationship with him. Okay? You must be growing with him. You need to be getting to know him, or you will never know what he's going to ask of you. You have to be seeking a relationship with him through his word, the Bible, and by staying prayed up. And then doing what he says. Some folks... 
are real good at staying prayed up, maybe not as much read up. Some folks are real good at staying read up, not as much prayed up. Some folks are really good at being prayed up and read up, but they're not real good at doing what it says. I read a quote this week. It has nothing to do with, with, with the Bible, but it just popped up in my head. It said, I'm going to say it all wrong now. But the man, it said this, the man who does not read has zero advantage over the person who cannot read. That's the quote. I, didn't read, I don't even remember where I read it, but it came across it here. Think about that. The person who does not read has zero advantage over the person who cannot read. Sometimes we wonder how come we don't have all this figured out. I think sometimes we waste way too much time waiting on somebody to tell us all about it rather than going to get it on our own. There is a wealth of knowledge. There is a bunch of growing to do when you stay in here. Sure, there are some things that hurt. Sometimes feel like you're taking a hook in. <laughs> I've read some things in here. I'm, I remember one time I read a particular verse when I was brand new Christian, brand spanking new. Back when I used to think, oh, how is it that these people get to know the Bible so well? You know, y'all you ever, ever wonder that? Look at so-and-so. He could just quote scripture like nothing. I'll never be like that. I used to think that. One time I read a verse, and it slapped me in the face so hard, I never forgot it. Never forgot it. And it's in James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Actually, there's three verses I remember. Never did I ever forget those things. If you lack wisdom, ask him who gives without finding fault. But when you do, you must believe and not doubt. Oh, my goodness. I remember sitting there as a young Christian reading that going, you must believe and not doubt. And I'm thinking like, every time I pray, I'm doubting. Does that sound familiar? Every time I pray, I'm wondering, is God really listening to me? Am I really that important to him? No. I shouldn't be thinking that way. I must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like the waves of the sea, tossed and blown by the wind. And that man should not expect anything from the Lord because he is double-minded and unstable in all he does. Slap! <laughs> I felt like the Lord was calling me double-minded and unstable. Yes, it, it hurts sometimes. That's the pruning. That's the pruning process. If you have a branch that's not bearing fruit and I come cut it off, don't you think that's going to hurt? Yeah. But it needs to happen. We can't be afraid of that sort of pruning. That's why a lot of people, I think, don't want to get too immersed in Jesus Christ. Because, hey, the truth does what? The truth hurts. But the truth is what sets you free. But we've gotten way too accustomed to comfortable lies. But a little bit of a stinging truth is a no-no. Most people now that you'd rather me comfortably lie to, lie to you and make you feel comfortable than me tell you the truth that might hurt you a little bit. That's not what God wants. He wants to tell you the truth. And the truth is, you have to stay hooked no matter what. And when you do come off, let's just say it gets a little rough and you lose your seat or you lose your hook and you do come off. Guess what you're supposed to do? Get back on. Catch him. Y'all, we all out there the day that I come off blued up. He didn't, really didn't buck me off. I was kind of embarrassed because I more so fell off. But what did I do? Mainly because y'all were watching me. A part of me was pretty scared. But that's why I did that. Because I knew y'all be watching me. <laughs> so I jumped right up and I ran over there as fast as I could. I didn't even walk. Give myself a chance to think about it. Oh, man, all of a sudden my leg hurts a lot. Every step I take towards him, you know what, guys? You know, maybe I shouldn't. No. I was like, before I change my mind, before I change my mind, I'm going to run over there, and I'm going to get back on him. Can't give Satan too much chance to work on you, and he will. 
Got to stay hooked. Got to stay hooked. You know, there's uh, one more little story here. You know, we were talking about Tuff Hedeman earlier. Tuff Hedeman, you know, one of the greatest bull riders of all time. And he rode at the time where, arguably, the greatest bucking bull of all time. His name is Bodacious. Whew. I remember watching the, the rodeo when Tuff Hedeman got his face smashed. Bo, he was riding Bodacious. Bodacious had this name they call it Drop. They call it, they call it Drop and, and I feel so silly. <laughs> anyway, like when the bull goes up, it's, he's not just falling back down. He's pulling you down so that when he hits the bottom, your momentum keeps, keeps your body coming down while he's coming back up. That's bad. That's bad. When he can drop you that hard that you just fold over and then all of a sudden his head's coming back up. Lights out. He did this to a lot of cowboys. But the best one, the best one, one of the greatest of all time, drew him. And he smashed his face. One of the worst rodeo injuries you will ever see. He laid there in the dirt with his face rearranged. He's walking off there. Talk about tough. <laughs> talk, talk about being named tough. He got the name tough because he got his hand smashed in the car door. And he didn't cry. That's why they started calling him tough. But dang, this dude got his face smashed by Bodacious. And guess what? He walked off. Tough. Yeah, but you know, while he was walking off, he didn't look the same. Like his eyeball wasn't where it was, his nose wasn't where it was. I mean, it was kind of like, it was weird looking. Well, he got better, believe it or not. And within the same season, he went back to riding bulls crazy dude. Went back to riding bulls. All the while hoping what? Hoping he would never ever ever draw bodacious. Because here's the thing about when you draw a bull you have to at least attempt to ride him. Well they, they go to the national finals. And tough being tough, even though he had a broken face he rode good enough to make the finals. The national finals. Well, you think Bodacious all of a sudden became a junkie bull? No. He was still the best of the best. Guess who also made the finals? <laughs> Bodacious. And, with, you know, in the finals, you draw how many bulls? Ten bulls. Ten bulls in the finals. You got to ride. Ten of them. And you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to ride eight of them. And I'm just not going to ride two of them. No, you have to at least attempt to ride all ten of them. You have to attempt to ride all ten of them to qualify for the, for the winning. At least attempt. It doesn't say you have to ride all of them. You have to at least attempt to. Well, sure enough, the drawing comes out because it's all draws. Tough heat and draws. Bodacious. Mm. And he has to attempt to ride. Most of us get put, put in situations like that, and we just duck tail and run, right? And we'll just flat out say, no, I don't want no part of that. That's crazy. Well, you know something? Tough really didn't ride him that day. You know what he did? He got down in the chute when it was his turn to ride. Now imagine, whoo, you're sitting on the bull that, I mean, by all accounts, it's lucky he's still alive. And he's sitting on his bull, and he knows he has to at least come out with him. He has to nod his head, yes. Oh, my goodness. You know what he did? Despite his pride, 
to defy all those things the, the, that us humans have that keep us from, for some reason, wanting to do the things that we should be doing and keep us doing some things that we shouldn't be doing. He gave Satan, if you will, the proper respect. When that boy, I know life has you in places where you got to ride. There are some things you need to step off of, though. There are so, some things you need to just step off of. They're not good for you. They're part of life. You got to ride. There are some things you need to step off of. God's not one of them. Scripture's not one of them. Praying is not one of them. Doing what God says is not one of them. All that which is evil, all that which is worldly, all those things that keep us traveling down the wide and narrow gate, I mean, down the wide and open gate, those are the things we need to quit doing. Tough Peterman, not this head, yes, but they just come out bucking by himself. Here, we, here is one of the greatest riders of all time. He nods his head, he opens the gate, and he just steps off of him. He steps over the chutes, he turns around, all the cameras are on him. And you talk about, you talk about respect now. You know what Tough Hedeman did? He stood there, he took his hat off, tipped it to the bull. He said, you're better than me, and I don't want to mess with you anymore. Guys, if you don't think that Satan's going to slip in the chute when you're trying to settle down in there to carry you for a little while, you're wrong. But the reason we have to stay prayed up, and the reason we have to stay read up, and the reason we have to stay uh, uh, doing what he says because that's the only way you're going to recognize when Satan's in the chute. And when he's in there, you know what? Let him go out there by himself. Get off. Even if you do tip your hat to him because you're better than me, I'm serving this other guy. He'll go, well, he's fixing to whoop you. Satan, I say all that to say this. Satan can't do anything with you or to you if you don't go with him. If you stay on him and you hook on to him thinking that's what you're supposed to do, your face is going to be broken. But then we can't wonder why. Why is my face all busted up? You got on the baddest son of a buck there is. And that's what he does. So choose today who you're going to mount up with. Choose right now. Because, folks, it's time to settle down in the chute. God's calling. He's tugging at every single one of you. If that wasn't the truth, you wouldn't be here today. He's tugging at you. He's saying, hey, I want you. I want you to be mine. I want to be all yours. I want you to embed yourself in me and stay in me so that I can stay in you. Settle down on me. This ride ends up in the winner's circle. Ride me. Bodacious will get you killed. Bodacious will take you places you don't want to go. Get off him and stay on me. Now, folks, I understand that settling down in that chute, I understand what that feels like. And you may be feeling that right now as, you, as, you, as you're pondering like what, what Jesus wants from you. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to step. If I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today, I don't know what the ride's going to be like tomorrow. That's okay. Stay on. Don't be afraid of that ride. Even though it, it's rough, it bucks, it spins, it belly rolls, but it won't kill you. It'll take you. To the winner's circle. That other ride won't. Could be that you're settling down. You're settling down in the chutes right now. This may be. You might feel Jesus calling and tugging at your heart for the first time, and you're ready to answer. And you're scared to death, and your heart's doing this number. That's okay. 
nod your head to Jesus. Say, let's go. I'll go with you. Say that today. Embed yourself in him. Stay hooked on. Get your spurs. Get them all rusty. Run a bolt through them where they don't spin and sink them down into Jesus Christ and don't come unhooked. I promise you when the ride is over, you'll love the prize. Amen. If you don't know how to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there are no fancy words you have to say in some particular order to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You just, you just tell him what's in your heart and ask him to become your Lord and Savior. Mean it with everything you, you have and become his. If you don't know what to say, you can repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I've been embedded into this world way too long. Both rides buck, Lord. Only one gets us to the winner's circle, though. And today I want to get off those dishes and get on you. And I want to ride with you way off into eternity. Jesus, I want to ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. I want to ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And count them against me no more. I believe in you. Not only do I believe in the death that you suffered for me, but I also believe in the resurrection that you showed me that I'll get to share in as well by trusting in you. Jesus, build a home in my heart and dwell in it forever till the day you call me home. And Father, for the person who prayed that prayer for the very first time, I pray you give them the courage to indicate on the bottom of their program that they've accepted your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For we know this ride is tough and it bucks and kicks. And it's not a ride that's good to ride on your own. So help us team up with these folks that are becoming new in Christ so that we may help them grow up in their salvations so that they can become champion bull riders for you and your glory. So, Father, we love you and we praise you and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Band's going to come up here and lead us in a little more worship. Appreciate y'all.